Let's uh, open up to Psalm 19. I want to go to Psalm 19 today, and we're going to talk about our awesome God. I want to hopefully maybe stretch your mind a little bit today, as the psalmist did when he got a good look at what creation he was aware of at that time, and stood in awe of God. There's a lot about our creation that reveals a lot of mystery, not just things that cause us to stand in awe of God, but mystery concerning Him and His heart, His, his character, His nature, but it's positive mystery. David, when he wrote this psalm in Psalm 19, he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The expanse shows His handiwork. Day after day they pour out speech, and night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their voice has gone out through all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In them He has set a tent for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his room like a strong man rejoicing to run his course. His going out is from the end of the heavens, his circuit to its ends, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. And then, of course, he goes on to talk about God's law, God's truth, and the perfection of it, and the glory of it, and the effect, the positive effect God's truth has on our hearts and our lives. Today, in the age in which we live, uh, maybe we're getting close to 3,000 years removed from when David wrote these words, his understanding, as well as the understanding of all of the people in his day concerning the universe that he was aware of and that he could visibly see with his eyes, His understanding of it was completely different than what our understanding of it is today with all of the modern inventions that we have and things that we can see now that David, 3,000 years ago, had no clue about. I mean, he wasn't aware of all of the things that we're aware of concerning the universe in which we live. There was this simplicity, as it were, to their cosmology, their understanding of the way the universe was shaped and the world itself, how it was made. And if you remember several years ago when we were doing the series on the uh, war that goes on in the heavenlies and the angelic beings and all of those things, we talked a little bit about the ancients' understanding of the universe. And kind of if you remember this first diagram that I want to put up, this is kind of how they saw everything. This is how they viewed it. I mean, they saw the earth there in the middle, basically, is an immovable object. Some diagrams have pillars, four pillars, because they talk about the foundations of the earth and the pillars of the earth. They believe that the seas extended out, but at some point, they came to an end. Some people would say, well, this is kind of more like a flat earth theology, maybe. I don't know, is that kind of what it is? Well, maybe in some ways. But we know that the Scripture talks about, at least 50 times in the Scripture, the ends of the earth. And we also know that the Scripture also speaks a great deal about the immovableness of the earth. It talks about the sun. And of course, their understanding at that time, as was until the Middle Ages concerning the sun, was that the sun was revolving around the earth because they saw it move through the sky. And their understanding was, well, maybe the, the sun's moving around the world. The world's, it's, it's sort of a geocentric universe the earth is the center of everything and then of course they saw the stars and the moon and uh, they talked about all that and of course above that they believed there was the great dome that the scripture talks about in genesis about the watery dome the that separated the waters below and the waters above and then the firmament that was there and then they believed at that time that beyond the firmament above the the waters above and then beyond that was the dwelling place of God he he dwells as they considered in the highest of the heavens and that was their simplistic understanding of the world now again when we go to the bible we don't go to the bible as a science book because it's not that 
But we know if the science, if the Bible addresses something that deals with science, it's, it's going to be accurate and correct. But again, David is simply writing from his perspective and his understanding of what he knew, what he grew up, what he was taught, and his understanding of how God had made everything. But then, of course, we know that all of that understanding began to change in the Middle Ages and telescopes started being invented and there was a math that started being developed that could trace the orbits of the planets and the sun and going around the sun. That took a, a, a decentralization away from the earth now. Now they started to realize, oh, the, 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 the earth is actually going around the sun. And of course, you remember, there was a great deal of controversy in the church over this. I mean, if people embraced at, at one point in time, there were people literally being persecuted because they actually believed that the, the sun was the center of the system and not the earth, and they began to teach that based on their discovery scientifically. And the church reacted toward that and wanted to try to you know, silence all of that until finally, eventually, you know, people began to come around and say, oh, you know, these guys are right. The earth is not the center of the universe, and we're actually moving around the sun. And a lot of the things that you and I take for granted today, I mean, we just sort of just take it for granted were a cause of great controversy at one point in time in history. And now we live in a world that has super powerful telescopes. We're sending telescopes out into space. We sent Hubble telescope out there in this space. And then, of course, now we've got the Webb telescope that's given us clearer pictures and being able to see further out into the expanse of not only our own galaxy, but also into the expanse of the universe. And we have, by virtue of these things and all of the other inventions that are allowing us to explore the cosmos that's out there, we are learning that the place in which God put us is not only a place of awe and wonder, but it's a place of great mystery. Surprising mystery at times. Now, when we look at the universe... And we'll see this in a minute. It's interesting because there was a Jewish scientist, an astrophysicist, uh, Gerald Schroeder, who came up with a mathematic formula based upon some of Einstein's discovery, and we'll see that in a minute, that proves that the, from the perspective of Genesis, when you're looking in one direction, the universe was literally created in six 24-hour days. But when you look at it from a, another direction, you see a universe that is about 13.8 billion years old. How can that be? Because he, as a Jew, and he teaches Torah as well in a university in Israel, he believes the Scripture. When the Scripture talks about God created the heavens and the earth, and there's day one, day two, day three. But he understood, he believed that there's one, one perspective that we need to approach this from. And then when you look at it from another perspective, it too is correct. And how can that be? And we'll see why in just a minute. But we've got a universe that we know is old. We also know that as they're discovering the result of these telescopes now, that in the universe itself, when Hubble first went up and they started seeing all these other galaxies and they started estimating, well, you know, there's probably 300 and some billion galaxies out there, not much different than the one we live in. Now, with the new telescopes that are going out there estimating because they're able to see further out into the universe, the possibility of two trillion galaxies that are out there, that, and that is as far as they can see, and they've not reached the edge. They can't see yet beyond what they can see now, but they're, they're estimating that obviously there's a whole lot more, and each one of these galaxies containing hundreds of billions of stars and potential planets and all of those things that are out there. And the distances, as you remember when you were in science class growing up, that we deal with all of this stuff and we start getting beyond the atmosphere of the earth is in terms of light years. How far something is, is, is away from us or how fast something travels, it's based upon light years. 
And sometimes the numbers that we throw around concerning the universe and its size, we're so used to hearing big numbers sometimes. You know, we talk about the trillions of dollars that we're in debt, you know, with the United States here and all the problems with all that. And we use that term, we just sort of throw it out. We don't think about the bigness of it. We don't think about the largeness of it. I mean, it's just a, a, a word that we throw out of our mouth, not realizing the size and the scope of what we're actually talking about. But if we start thinking about it in literal terms, when we start allowing our minds to race, just like David was allowing his mind to race when he wrote this and talking about the glory and majesty of God that could see above him, it will humble us in some very profound ways. Now we know that the speed of light, being able to be measured, it goes at 186,282 miles per second. That's not a minute, that's not an hour, that's every second light travels that quick. And if you and I could travel at that speed right now and just instantly do it, in one short second, we could make 37 round trips between New York and Los Angeles. In one second, traveling at the speed of light. And each way, it's about 5,000 miles long. 37 trips. And the speed of a little more than what it takes you and I to blink our eye that fast. And when we measure the universe and how they use instruments to measure the universe, we're talking about not millions, but billions of light years that they can see out into the distances beyond. The known universe, what they can measure now and they can sort of calculate with is about 93 billion light years across. 93 billion light years. That is 37 round trips between Los Angeles and New York each second of each minute of each day of each year for 93 years billion years and the number of miles that that would cover would be just absolutely meaningless was just a number with a bunch of zeros after it i don't know about you but that's big that is big i mean it's staggering when we begin to let our minds race to it and when we look at Psalm 19 and we look at Psalm or Romans 1 where Paul talks about that the the universe is telling us about the nature and character of God. There are things that we can learn about God from His creation if we observe it. Paul talks about we can learn about His divine power. We can learn about His wisdom. We can learn about His grace, His love. There's a lot of things that creation teaches us about the nature and character of God. And I like to think that if David were to know what we know today about the universe, he would have used some different words when he wrote this psalm. I mean, when he starts out and says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and when he talks about the expanse, well, David's understanding of the expanse was limited, but when we talk about expanse and we're talking about 93 billion light years, that's mind-blowing. I think David would have just had his breath taken away from him trying to find words to describe the majesty and character of God. And yet, the further we go out and the more discoveries we make, the more mysterious the universe becomes to us about how it operates, both on the big macro level as well as on a micro level. The world that's all around us that, that is so tiny that the universe is made up of with the protons and the neutrons and all the quantum physics, which we'll, we'll see in a moment, it blows our mind at how it is all constructed and made. But when we talk, start talking about mystery at what we're seeing out there, if, if David says the heavens declare the glory of God and all that we see out there are telling us things about God, one of the things that it will tell us about God so we hadn't got him all figured out. There are aspects to him that are mysterious. And we have to learn to live with the mystery 
of God. And as I've talked about before when we were doing this series on life after life, there are things about God that we don't even know about yet. He's not revealed everything about himself to us yet. He's revealed all we need to know, to know he's good and he's love and all those essential things. But there are things about him that we can't comprehend yet. We couldn't. He couldn't download it into our brains because our brains would explode with the information. We couldn't handle it. So majestic and so glorious are the things about him. But he's given us enough to know that he is a good and a glorious God. Regaining a sense of the mystery of God is something that's very, very important for us in our walk with Him. And God is a great deal more amazing, awesome, awe-inspiring, big than what we've ever conceived. I mean, think about when we are looking, when the Hubble telescope first went up, and then, of course, the Webb telescope that's out there and we pull out a calculator and we start calculating the images that are being sent back to us. And we go, okay, well, what's the nearest star to us that we could, if we could travel to it, how far away? The nearest star that we look at up in our galaxy is 4.25 light years away, which is 26 trillion miles away from us. That's 37 con- cross country round trips every second of every minute of every day for 1,570 days, 135 million cross country trips at light year speed every second. And all that adds up to 135 million trips. The nearest galaxy to us, Andromeda, 2.5 million light years away or 15 quintillion miles away from us, or 79 trillion cross-country trips at the speed of light every single second. And then you start thinking about just that one galaxy, that distance, and we start talking about the possibility of between one and two trillion galaxies out there in our universe when we look up in the heavens and every one of them filled with billions of stars and all of these galaxies placed in exactly the spot where they're placed in billions sometimes of light years away from each other. Maybe we need to start learning how to adjust our language when we start talking about our great and big God. When we look at the sun that's shining out there today, Scientists say that the sun is one astronomical unit away from us. An astronomical unit is 92,955,887 miles. And in the fastest ship we could get in right now that we have, it would take us 25 days to get there. The universe, as I said, I believe is 93 billion light years across of what they can see. Right now, 93 billions. And one light year is equivalent to 63,000 astronomical units of almost 94 million miles each. Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, okay, I didn't know I came to church for a science lesson. I want you to start letting your mind race. I, you need to sit there and be staggered by trying to think of these things because of how big they are. But not only that, because it points to how big God is. How awesome God is for you and I. I mean, if one light year is equivalent like six trillion miles, we've got a universe that's 93 billion light years in diameter, and that's not even the end of it. That's as far as they can see, but they know there's more beyond. They just can't see that far yet. It's just the observable universe. And some estimate that it could be 250 times larger than what we can observe. Than what we can see with the most powerful telescopes that we have, or at least 7 trillion light years across. Now stop and think about that. 
And we read in Isaiah, the prophet tells us about this great creation and that the creator holds it all in the palm of his hand. All of it. In the palm of his hand. And that all of this was spoken into existence. Desired, willed into existence by God. And it all holds together every little proton, every little quark, every little package of all the smallest units and the largest, most powerful things in the universe are all held together by His desire, His will. Period. That's it. This God that we start reading about is an awesome God. And the writers in Scripture understood this, but they didn't understand it even to the extent that you and I understand it. I don't know, you probably have seen this picture. There is a, a place in our galaxy known as the Pillars of Creation. This is a phenomenal expanse of gas and stars and all of the things that you can imagine. The pillar that's up there on the left, that big tall one, do you know how many light years it is across, it's, or, or long it is? 20, it's 12 miles wide, 25 trillion miles in length 25 trillion miles in length and one of the little tiny jutty fingers at the top even of the left one one of the little tiny fingers in that you could fit our whole solar system in one of the little tiny fingers that's up there and we look at this out there in, in space and all of these things and we're sitting there and we're we're trying to consider the size of this and what is that? You know, when we look at it and it, it's out there, but yet it is again what the scripture says. When we see these things, they are screaming at us of a God who is big, a God who is powerful, a God who is wise, a God who is smart, and a God who is creative beyond our wildest imaginations. When we start thinking about the age of, of the universe, and there's the next diagram that I want to show you, and we kind of look at it at uh, this perspective. You're looking at it like you're looking in to our universe right now. They, they, they sort of look at it like a circular tube-like thing, and we're looking into it. And of course, at some point, way back into this long cone-like thing, was the beginning. There was a moment and an instant when everything came into existence and began to go forward and began to move out. And all within this vast, this vast cone are all of these trillions of stars and galaxies. And again, we look at science and, and science tells us, well, listen, we're living in a universe, you know, that's 13.8 billion years old. And, uh, you know, we, we, we as Christians, we sit back and we try to struggle with that. Well, wait a minute. The Bible talks about the earth was created in six days and, you know, 24 hours a, a day. Well, as I told you, this Jewish scientist, Gerald Schroeder, this astrophysicist, came up with a calculation years ago that shows that both are right. It just depends on which perspective you're looking at it from. So I've got a little video of Gerald just explaining this on our level, that we can understand it by. So let's, let's listen to that real quick. The ancients of the Near East really were well acquainted with the movement of the stars. But if the ancients were so good at using the heavenly bodies to track time, then what did they think of the biblical concept of creation? How could they possibly believe that the entire universe and everything in our planet was created in just six days like it says in the Bible. Wouldn't Genesis sound like some elaborate children's story? Today, scientists believe that the universe was formed not in six days, but over the course of billions of years. But it turns out that modern science and the Bible may both be right. And I found an astrophysicist who believes he can explain why. In the Bible, God says, let there be light, and wham, there is light. God then creates the entire universe, including our own planet, in only six days. Throughout history, 
science has insisted that the universe is eternal and that the Bible's explanation is nothing more than myth. But recently, a theory has emerged that the universe did have a beginning. It started off with a big bang. But according to that theory, it took billions of years to create the universe, not six days. So I'm on my way to Jerry Schroeder. He's an astrophysicist who believes that modern science and the book of Genesis don't contradict each other. Well, let's talk about the Big Bang. Most people think there's a basic conflict between the Bible's idea of the origin of the universe and modern science. I should put it this way, in simple words, the discovery of the Big Bang is the best news for God since Moses came down from Sinai. Nothing can match it. There was a creation to the world. The Big Bang says there's a creation. Most people say, yeah, but um, that beginning is, uh, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a six day creation. It's, it's uh, billions of years. We're not talking days, we're talking Eon. Ah, ah, so for, well, there's two problems here. First, the creation of the universe, we, we solved that problem. So is it billions of years or is it uh, numbers of days? From the creation of the universe to the creation of the soul of Adam on day six, the universe has to advance from a, bo a burst of energy to the existence that we know, the modern, modern man. All I need to know is how time dilation would work from this moment when matter forms till today or Adam or any time that you want in the modern world. And we know that number. We know the ratio of this dilation of time. It's not, it's not gravity and it's not velocity. It's the stretching of space. The original space stretch it almost like rubber. And that affects the perception of time when seen at a distance. Physicists around the world agree that the Big Bang created our universe. And as it expanded, it stretched by a factor of a trillion. As space stretches, it also distorts time and that's why from Earth the universe appears to be approximately 15 billion years old. But if you were to observe the universe from its point of origin, it would appear much, much younger. Jerry Schroeder has come up with a formula that he believes reflects the age of the universe from the perspective of the origin of the Big Bang. He took the 15 billion years that science estimates to be the age of the universe and divided it by the stretching factor. He came up with the number 0 0.015. Converted into days just happens to equal six days. The fact is the universe is six days old from this perception and billions of years from this perception, provided you take the view from the beginning looking forward. Those six 24-hour days do indeed contain all the ages, the billions of years. So you're saying there's God's clock? The Bible's and, clock. Okay, let me The Bible's okay, clock. Okay, all right, so you're saying there's the Bible's clock. For the six days of Genesis. And there's kind of human, the human clock. Yes. And the first days until man is created is a, is a kind of a... Perception of time from the beginning looking forward. Do you think the ancients somehow intuitively understood that when they looked up at the heavens? I think we all understand it. It sounds strange, but we have a cosmic memory. And the ancients, being closer to nature, could in fact look at the stars and I don't feel it. They saw that they were part of this big system. There wasn't this tremendous separation that we have today. Time is pliable. Understanding it is a matter of perspective. There's creation from the biblical perspective and creation from our own somewhat shrunken point of view. There may be knowledge in the Bible that is ahead, not behind science's current understanding of the cosmos. So you sit there and you think, okay, but again, all perspective. And when you start talking about time dilation, which he was talking about, that's a mystery. How from this perspective back here, when you're looking from when God spoke it into existence, time-wise, it can be equated and factored out exactly six 24-hour days. And yet on this end of it, where we are looking back from a perspective of time, it appears to be billions of years. Again, mystery, how God is able to factor in all of this. So the universe, when we look at it now, when we look at it from that perspective in this next slide, you got this end down here, the beginning, and you've got this universe, and we know that the universe is expanding. It's getting bigger. 
Things are moving outwardly. Why? Because in the beginning, God spoke it into existence. And so all of this is transpired and taking place, and we're existing inside of this. And when you start getting into all of the interesting things about science, again, the, more, the deeper you go down the rabbit hole, the more your jaw drops at the wonder of the universe that we live in and that God has created and made. We talked about a while, several years ago, about this whole idea of quantum physics and how now that all that's being factored in when you get down to the smallest of particles. And as I said, we got a, a universe all around us that is minuscule and that is just as equally mysterious and amazing as that which you can look out into space and see. We start talking about protons and neutrons. If you want to get down to the level, let's say, of a proton, you would need to take a yardstick and slice that yardstick into one billion segments. And then you, should, you can take one of those segments and slice it into one million segments, and you are getting down then to the size of what we're starting to talk about when we talk about protons and the universe being built on these things and the activity of all of this that goes on. Time. Time is something that is an amazing thing to think about. It's not always constant like we used to think. There are changes and even moments when time and space itself can be bent, science has discovered. It actually passes, time does, more slowly the closer one is to a massive object like Earth and more quickly, the further away one is from that object. So if somebody is living, theoretically, somebody lives at sea level, they don't age as quickly as somebody living in a high-rise building because of their position in relationship to the mass of earth that is underneath them. And time will pass more slowly for them it seems perceptually that those who live at sea level, so technically, <laughs> you know, our heads age faster than our feet. But then when we start thinking about it, speed also affects the perception of time. I mean, someone that's moving very rapidly past the surface of the earth will experience time moving more slowly compared with those who are stationary right here on the Earth. I mean, astronauts who are riding in the orbit on the space station, they're moving five miles every second through space. And vacationers who are on an airplane flying to Hawaii, up high up off the ground, 35,000 feet up, these will age more slowly than those who are Earth-bound. Speed slows down time. And if an astronaut were to get in a rocket ship and go to Mars, their actual age, as far as what we're perception, it might take them 10 years, but as far as their body aging, they will have only aged between five and six years because of the speed at which they are moving through the solar system to get to Mars. I mean, the universe, it's all around us. When we start thinking about, I mean, quantum physics and things like that where you talk about entanglement and that you can take two particles that are entangled together and then you can separate those two particles away from each other and you can put one at one end of the universe, another one at another end of the universe, 93 billion light years away from each other. And if you turn this one down here, that other one on the other side is going to respond immediately, instantaneously, faster than the speed of light. And scientists don't understand how all that works. That they are somehow interconnected, and yet they are 93 billion light years away from each other. And how they get that even faster can move faster than the speed of light itself in their response. I mean, you start getting down into the world, and you start looking at the creation and all of the majestic things just in our own earth that boggle our mind. We don't have language, really, that's adequate to describe then when we start talking about the God who made all of this, how majestic and how wonderful and how glorious this God really is. But when we start seeing these things, they should affect how we think and perceive God and what we find revealed about Him in the Scripture. I mean, 
one of the things that we can certainly conclude is that God is powerful, but He is not predictable. He's powerful, but He is not predictable. Think about all the weird stuff God did in the Bible. Miracles and things. When I say weird, things that didn't make sense. I mean, why does Jesus walk up to a guy who's blind, take a spit and make mud, plaster it all over his eyes, and then tell a blind guy to walk to a pool and wash the mud off of his eyes and he'll see? Of course, and he did. That makes sense. Why couldn't you just say, see? And he could have. What kind of a God leads people to the edge of a of an ocean, a Red Sea, and then tells Moses to hold a rod up all night long, and then with the blast of the wind, parts the sea in order that the Israelites could pass through on dry ground. I mean, think about the things, I mean, God has asked people to do. I mean, you know, Jesus does miracles, and a lot, a lot of the things that he does, well, give me five loaves and two fish, that's all I need, and just bring them here, and he blesses them, and then all of a sudden he multiplies these loaves and the fishes, or why does he come walking on top of water in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm, to come to his disciples? God is all the way through the Scriptures. There are many demonstrations of his power. The whole Bible, we talk about miracles. The whole Bible, there's only about 250 miracles listed in the whole of Scripture. And all of them have some sort of strangeness to them. Uniqueness. And in every one of them we see that the God we serve, He's powerful. But He is not predictable. He is not going to always act and do and think like you and I. As He tells us in Scripture, He is not a man like us, He says, who thinks as we think. His ways are not our ways. They're much higher. And we need to learn how to live with that reality. To know that he's powerful, but I can't always predict what he's going to do in a given situation with me. I also know that he's wise, but he doesn't explain a lot. You ever notice when you read through the book of Job, and you see Job has all this going for him, and then all of a sudden he loses it all, everything. He's sitting there, he's scraping the sores off of his body, he's lost his family, he's lost his wealth, he's lost everything. He is the object, it seems, of some sort of a cosmic chess match going on between God and the devil. And all of these things are happening to him, and then his buddies start showing up and start blaming him and telling him all the reasons why God did all this stuff to him when God had nothing to do with it from that standpoint. But in the, in the sense of you see God, then he begins to question Job, and all the things that God begins to question Job about are revealing about his acts demonstrated in creation. His power that's demonstrated in creation. We see his wisdom. But did you ever notice there is not one verse in the book of Job where God explained to Job, this is why this happened to you. Not one. We need to learn how to live with questions sometimes that don't get answers. Because God's not always going to give us the answer. He's wise but he always doesn't explain a lot. And then we can find that God is ever present, but he doesn't always make his presence known. He is filling the whole universe with his presence. He is within everything he has created. There's an aspect of his life that's energizing it. He is present in all places at all times. And yet sometimes, and you know this and so do I, when, when we're going through difficult, hard places in our life, we cry out, God, where are you? And sometimes he doesn't let us know that he's there. We don't feel it. We don't experience the closeness maybe that we had at one time. Whatever circumstances we're in, we just feel like, He's way far away. Where are you? Just like David and other psalmists write, God, where are you? And sometimes we have to trust of His presence. 
but he doesn't always make it known. Look at the book of Esther. Not one time in the book of Esther is God mentioned of being active in all that situation. Not one time. One of the only books in the Bible where he's not mentioned. And yet you see his activity in the circumstances that were happening with Esther and Mordecai and Haman and all of that. How he was at work. But he's not mentioned. We also need to know that God is a mystery that we cannot figure out. Just like when we look out there at this creation, both visible and the invisible one that's all around us, and there's a lot of mystery to it, God is the same way. And Lamont said the first holy truth in God 101 is that men and women of true faith have always had to accept the mystery of God's identity and love and his ways. I hate that, she said, but that's the truth. John Calvin wrote, man with all of his shrewdness is as stupid about understanding by himself the mysteries of God as an ass is un incapable of understanding musical harmony. We can't grasp what he is and who he is. We also know when we look at this, that this God, and we sang about it a while ago, this God is wild, he is untamable, but he is eternally good. He's wild, he's untamable, but he's eternally good. C.S. Lewis got this when he was writing those series of books, the Chronicles of Narnia, when he developed the character of Aslan, the great mighty lion who ruled and created Narnia and all worlds. And one writer described Aslan as intolerably severe and irresistibly tender. He's the rightful king. He's the rightful ruler of Narnia, and he is not to be trifled with in any way, shape, or form. When the children Lucy and Peter and Edmund, all of those came to Narnia, and they first heard about Aslan, they asked the question if they should be afraid. And Lou, Susan said, well, is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Miss Beaver said, if there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Lucy responded, then he isn't safe. Safe, Beaver said. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. You see, Aslan, he's not a tame lion, but he's a good lion. But he's not safe. All throughout the Chronicles of Narnia, we encounter a being who's wild. He's on the loose. He is not to be tied down. He cannot be controlled. He cannot be manipulated. He cannot be bullied. He commands reverence. He commands obedience everywhere he goes. And when the children encounter him for the very first time and they face to face stand before Aslan, they are overwhelmed. Lewis wrote, people who have not been in Narnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good and terrible at the same time. If the children had ever thought so. They were cured of it now. For when they tried to look at Aslan's face, they just caught a glimpse of the golden mane and the great royal solemn overwhelming eyes and then they found they couldn't look at him and they went all trembling. Steve Brown says, if you've never stood before God and been scared spitless, you've never stood before God. When we're talking about all of this and as a being who created it, we're talking about a being who, yes, he is wild and he is untamable and he will not be bullied and he will not be overcome. He is all power. He is power itself. But he's good. Inestimably good. We also know that God is awesome to be feared and yet he is filled with creative joy and laughter. You need to get to be the perspective of a child when you're reading through the Gospels because there's a lot of things that are funny when a child reads the Gospels, the things that Jesus said, the things that Jesus did. Sometimes it caused them to get tickled and giggle. 
when they read it. And I think sometimes we lose that magic as we get older and we read the Bible. We lose that sense of wonder. We know God is a God who's filled with joy. I mean, look at his creativity. Look at, there's no two leaves the same, no two fingerprints the same. Look at the animals he's made. Have you ever seen a platypus? You ever looked at a giraffe? You ever looked at some of the creatures they're finding at the bottoms of the ocean? How weird and strange and odd that they look. And all of this, God created. A master artist. And every evening he displays his majesty with every sunset, every work of art, and no two sunsets are ever the same. He is a great creator. He is love. And he created a cosmic playground for us to play in. You think all of that that's out there is just for, sh just for show? Well, the Bible makes it clear to us that in the ages to come, we're going to be ruling with reign and reigning with Jesus over this vast creation. We don't know the wonders that await us out there. We don't know. We've got no clue. And yet he's created it for us. It declares his glory and his majesty, but it's there for us, as the scripture makes clear. The love of Christ, as we look at God and his power, embraces everyone without any exception. The prayer of pa Catherine of Siena said, fire of love, crazy over what you have made, O oh, divine madman. Simply do the next thing in love. As Bernie Manning said in a prayer, Lord, I have no sense of myself apart from you. In loving me, you've made me lovable. He is a God who is filled with infinite love for you and I. People who have walked with God for a long time Think about what if I had the chance to live my life over again? They, they talk about, you know, what would I change? What would I do differently, especially in my walk with God? One writer said, I've decided that if I had to live my life over again, I would not only climb more mountains, swim more rivers, watch more sunsets. I wouldn't only jettison my hot water bottle, my raincoat, my umbrella, my parachute, my raft. I would not only go barefoot earlier in the spring and stay out later in the fall, but I would devote not one more minute to monitoring my spiritual growth. No, not one. What he's saying is most of us spend our lives as believers navel-gazing instead of living and have seen the wonder of this around us and the God who made it all as our Father and living our life in relationship with Him. Looking at all of this, we can realize that God is also humble. He became one of us. He entered space and time, and he subjected himself to his own scientific laws in his own universe that he created, even death. Why? Because he refused to live without you. He wanted relationship with us. He wanted to live in union with us. He wanted to be with us. He wanted us to be with him. When I was laying in bed thinking about this the other night, thinking about the vastness of all of this, and my, I just, my mind, I was just letting it race as far as it could and then just feeling myself breaking into tears and think that God who made all of this condescended to take on real flesh and blood and limitation and live among you and I and then take upon himself the sin of the world so that he could free his creation from it and have a relationship with us. It boggles my mind to think of a God who would do that. He is humble. And even Paul talks about the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the world, in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels and proclaimed among the nations, believed upon in the world and taken up into glory. The mystery of it. 
that God, by looking at our creation, he is spirit. Jesus said, the Father, God is spirit, and he seeks those who worship him to worship him in spirit and truth. He is present. He is present in all. He is present to all. He is guiding the whole cosmos right now. He is moving history. Everything that is going on in this universe is moving toward an ultimate goal. And that goal is renewal and restoration. It's headed that way. My, 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 what a mind-blowing time that will be. And when you think about all of this as I close, think about your problems in your life. How much of a problem are they to a God who can make all this? How small and insignificant from the standpoint of him are your problems? This is why Jesus would say, nothing's too difficult for God. Nothing's too hard for him. You think you got problems? He's bigger than all your problems. There may be mystery to your problems. There may be things that you may not have explained to you like Job, but your problems and my problems, our difficulties, our hardships are no problem for him. And he invites us to trust that. Just trust. Trust. You don't have to be able to explain it all. You don't have to be able to put the figures in the numbers, but like the wonder of a child, you can stand there with your jaw dropped open, looking at the wonder of it all, and majesty, and stand in awe, and then take your problems and bring them side by side to a God who does all of that. Nothing. And who loves you. You can trust him. When our kids were little, when we lived in South Florida, we used to live, we lived out in the country, way out. We used to be able to drive because it was flat. We used to drive about 10 miles to Manatee State Park out near that direction. At night, we'd wait till it was, you know, 10, 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. There was no lights, artificial light out there where you could just see from horizon to horizon and see the stars and the universe and the creation was there. And I used to always tell them when they were looking at that, you know, they were looking at the power of God. And I'll never forget when they were like three and four years old and we'd go outside and I'd say to the girls, you want to go see the power of God? And you know what their first response was? Oh, I don't know. No, I don't know. We want to see the power of God. They were like Lucy, those children knocking knees, and they'd get out there, and it would literally sometimes frighten them at how big it was. And yet they would crawl up in my arms, and we'd stand there, and I'd have my arms around them, and we'd just stand there and gaze at it and look at the wonder of it all. The next time you think your problems are overwhelming, Next time you think your life is hard and difficult, step outside. Look up and know that all of that and the one who made it all is not against you. He's for you. And he's with you. And though he may not explain it all, he has the power to see you through it and can in an instant with just his word. Trust that. Father, we come before you humbly, recognizing your great and awesome power. Thank you for the universe that you've placed us in. Thank you for being good. Thank you for being love. We pray that you would help us to cast, as Paul said, all of our cares on you, as Peter reminded us as well, because you care for us. And whatever problems we may be facing this morning, help us to get a perspective of them, your perspective, and that nothing is impossible to you. In Jesus' name, amen.